Wollawani. I'm Megan Campbell from Palliative Care Australia in Canberra on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Welcome to Thursdays at Three, our regular series of conversations with people living and working at the end of life. Our guest today has experienced both through the death of her husband, Derek, in 2019, and today as CEO of a charity shaping family-friendly end-of-life options for people. Hello, Natasha Welsh. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me, Ian. Really looking forward to our, our conversation this afternoon, Natasha. Are you ready for this? We're going to be talking about some, some hard times in your life, and there's always an emotional weight that comes with that. But is there also something empowering about sharing your your family's story? Absolutely. Yeah, look, it is tough. Um, it, it never gets easier, I suppose, having gone through that process and then sort of shifting our grief into, into what we do today um, is empowering and it definitely is a testament to the legacy that I wanted to leave for Derek and, and for my son Christian um, honouring his dad. We're always better when people like you share their wisdom, Natasha. So thanks again for being here. Um, Derek died in, in August of 2019, almost four years ago, after mm -hmm. a 23-month battle with aggressive brain cancer. He was just one month short of his 36th birthday. Mm -hmm. Tell us about life with you and Derek and the, and the family before cancer stepped in. Yeah, look, uh, Christian um, was really little when Derek got diagnosed, so uh, we were a very young family. Um, and we're enjoying it very much so. Uh, we were actually almost uh, starting to think about having our second when Derek got sick, so um, that was definitely really hard. Um, but, yeah, we both worked and, and loved life and, and, and travelling and doing all sorts of things with Christian um, and really relishing those moments that we had um, at the beginning of his childhood. What's the love story, Natasha? How did you and Derek meet? <laughs> uh, we met through mutual friends, actually. Um, it was just, yeah, really coincidental. Uh, no dating apps or anything like that. They didn't really exist back then. But, yeah, we uh, met through two friends and uh, sort of blossomed from there and uh, were inseparable for, for a very long time. And where were you living at that time? Where was life uh, in still, still where I am today. So Sydney, um, I'm in Ryde and, and Derek grew up in Croydon Park. So we weren't too far away from each other, um, but our paths had never crossed and uh, both pretty active sports people and uh, sort of that was a big part of our beginning of our relationship growing up, growing through those stages. So he did cricket, I played soccer, and we always supported each other and, and enjoyed doing so. And then Derek starts to feel sick, unwell? Yeah, it all happened really quickly, actually. Um, you know, in hindsight, when the, the staff at the hospital ask, you know, have any has anything been happening and have you noticed anything, it's not until that point in time where you kind of, the penny drops about, a few little things that had happened in the months leading up to Derek's diagnosis. Um, but, yeah, he just sort of started having a few migraines, uh, losing his balance at work. He was a landscape gardener um, mm. and just noticed it. Um, the other thing too was he also started feeling a lot of anxiety um, and I tried to help him as, as much as I could through that, but it got to a point where I said, I think you should, you know, get some help. Um, and then what unfolded was that, you know, as they mostly do in, in medical GPs, you know, they just sort of, he said he had depression, should go and speak with a with a psychologist um, and it was kind of left there. And so he did that and then not long after he just sort of woke up one day with a terrible migraine and vomiting and we presented at the emergency department. So, yeah, I'd say it was about a journey of maybe three or four months with some odd sort of symptoms and feelings mm -hmm. and emotions um, and then we started our GBM journey. Can you help us better understand the anxiety and the and the depression that Derek was feeling? Was that a, a symptom of of the cancer or 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 a result of of how you feel when you're sick? I think it was the cancer. So mm -hmm. where his lesions were were at um, one of them particularly was at the front of the brain, which affects our sort of our emotions and our character and. I suppose, you know, they can't ever put a, a timeline of exactly when the lesion started growing. But, you know, on reflection, when you go back further, his behaviour had sort of changed, you know, moderately over the years and kind of just put it down to sort of growing up and having children, like having Christians. So it, it's hard to say, but he definitely sort of became really overwhelmed in those three or four months leading into the, I suppose, the tumour showing itself. Um, and he really struggled with that. 
and um, he was suffering quite a bit. So that's why we ended up at the GP. But it was a very short-lived, um, you know, we think you have depression, go speak to a psychologist. Um, it was actually there was a, a tumour growing in, in his head. Yeah, wow. How old was your little man, Christian, when all this is happening? Uh, he was two. He was mm -hmm. two. He was about to turn three. Um, so, yeah, very little. And that was, you know, something that, uh, you know, you can't kind of put words around that processing time and that happening to you. It was like a, a huge bomb exploding in, in our lives. Um, and, you know, I quite often tell this story and, and I'm, you know, proud to own the fact that this was how I felt because it's so horrible imagining a child having to grow up without their parent that I just kind of wanted Derek to pass away really quickly at that point in time when you're told how, you know, terminal it is and that there's really mm -hmm. no chance so that maybe Christian wouldn't have to remember him or experience that grief. Um, yeah. But what I, what I learned through our journey was that we created so many memories and lived a life, you know, that some people live over, you know, 10, 15 years, we jam packed into sort of those 23 months and that I don't regret now, like, you know, feeling that way, but then experiencing the journey that we went through to give Christian the life memories that he has now. Thanks for sharing that because it's really easy to feel some shame around this stuff sometimes, but these are such extraordinary experiences in our life. We really don't know how we're going to respond and, and react to them. Yeah, it, it took me by surprise too that that was my sort of first gut reaction when mm -hmm. I found out that it was so terminal. Sort of, We originally told it was 12 to 14 months, so you kind of can't even get your head around that short yeah. time frame and Christian being so little, but he really does have such beautiful memories of Derek and, um, you know, he's eight now and, you know, his counsellor once said when we first met him that, you know, Christian wouldn't really grieve or go through the bereavement process until he was about seven um, and he was really, you know, correct. So in the last six to 12 months, Christian started to articulate his feelings more about missing Derek and, you know, remembering things more. So it's a really beautiful thing to watch. Um, as much as it pains me sometimes that he has to go through it, he's um, really handled it well. Just trying to put myself in in your situation at that time and you, you're trying to make memories for Christian and, and as a family, but no doubt you're diving headfirst into cancer treatment as, as well. Mm. Is, is that what becomes your world? Oh, 100%. It was just, you know, life's turned upside down in, in a, you know, a moment's notice and it was this real fine line about, managing his treatment and being present at everything and understanding everything and trying to stay positive, which seems ironic given it's such a terminal diagnosis. Um, but we actually had very quite different journeys, Derek and I. Like, sadly, he never accepted that he would die, which I can't put myself in his shoes because it's easier said than done to be pragmatic and say, well, that's what it is and, you know, you're going to, to die. But we tried to have hope along the way and every time he would have a positive MRI scan or, you know, there was yeah. some good news, you'd hang on to it as much as you could. Like you wanted it to be different for you and there was a very small percentage of people who have success with GBM or who live longer than five years, but the stats are so small and we kind of thought because he was young and fit and healthy that he might be one of those people. So mm -hmm. it was obviously really shattering when we got to the end of life stage and, you know, we hadn't even made two years yet, but it was tough to sort of be on that one track of like treatment and being positive and hanging on to everything that you could for the moment and then being, you know, pragmatic about experiencing those moments with him, with Christian and making as many memories as we could. And also to whilst Derek was okay, because he kind of declined rapidly at one point and his movement changed. So it was harder to actually go and do things and, and have those experiences. So it was a fine line. Had you guys spent much time talking about death and dying and, and, and having those end of life discussions before all this? No, gosh, no. It was one of those no. things. I think it, it was a real learning curve for a lot of our family and friends, particularly, you know, our friends who are our age. It was mm -hmm. an awakening to them to to be alert to the fact that anything could happen and particularly around, you know, basic things like, you know, your will or 
life insurance or some of those things that you kind of do think about once you start your family. And our yep. family was so young with Christian being two, it, it was definitely on my list of things to do in terms of addressing those things. But it would have been good if we had have had those discussions earlier on, on reflection. But, you know, who was to say when he got diagnosed that that was going to be our life changing? So it was very tough along our journey to then have those discussions about you know, how Derek wanted to be buried or cremated, like he could never really have that conversation. So yeah. I had to just manage it out for us and for him because the devastation that he wouldn't be here to watch Christian grow up was just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, the palliative care service that you guys engaged with. It sounds like you've had a had a positive experience with palliative care. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, it, we were surrounded by great practitioners and, and teams and, and, you know, people who did talk to each other, which I think it can sometimes be an issue yes. in the medical system in general, right? Um, the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. But, yeah. no, we were, we were really fortunate. Um, we had a really good team at, at Royal North Shore and, and then aligned ourselves with Hammond Care for some, um, you know, palliative care sort of treatments. And Derek did a two-week cancer rehab stint at, at one of their facilities. Um, and then we ended up choosing a different location for end of life and it was purely based around the fact that I had this vision of what I imagined end of life care should look mm -hmm. like um, and particularly too for someone as young as Derek, um, it kind of broke me that end of life would be in what looked like typical hospital wards um, yeah. and I've told this story before, I watched a movie once with um, Tony Collette and, and somebody else and and her end of life is in this beautiful hospice, you know, somewhere in Europe, I can't remember the country, and I think I just I had fixated that, why, don't, why can't we have something as beautiful yeah. as that, you know, the surroundings be as, you know, lovely and, and green and all the rest of it. So, yeah, we ended up choosing um, Concord Hospital purely because they had this facility where they could open the doors, the bifold doors in the rooms, and you could roll the bed out. And just the, you know, having that as an option just made all the difference to being able to be outside and, and still feel the sun and those kind of simple pleasures. So, yeah, but it was a very good experience, um, aside from the fact that Christian wasn't able to stay with us overnight, um, which is just a, a legal insurance thing with public hospitals. Um, so that was interesting to sort of not understand that properly until we got to the end as well and we'd already made that decision um but we committed to it so it was sort mm -hmm. of knowing that when we left home and we'd been in palliative care for you know almost two months that i wouldn't be coming home until derek passed away so lucky to have really amazing family and support network that you know brought christian all the time and you know he was always there but that space was definitely I guess not what you would imagine it to no. be or should be for children of his age. And that, the, I guess, the the restrictions around Christian staying with you guys at Concord uh, and that sort of environment that you were looking for is very much what inspires Derek's place. And I'm keen to talk to you a bit more about Derek's place and the vision that you you have for that. But, but first, I'm keen just to tease out what palliative care looked like for you guys, um, we often talk about palliative care being that sort of holistic approach, multidisciplinary approach, um, the left hand and the right hand talking, hopefully. Um, what did it look like for you? What sort of services or therapists did you guys engage with that, that was good for you and good for Derek? Yeah, look, it, it's a really good question, Ian, and, and it's one that I, on reflection, look back and think, you know, perhaps I should have had that conversation about end of life or palliative care much earlier with our, you know, with our service providers. But you're so focused on the treatment and, you know, going through those motions that, and you don't want to talk about that because it's like almost taboo. That's at the end. We'll wait till mm. we get to the end. But then it kind of just was sprung on us. We're here now. And we hadn't built ourselves up for that very end bit. But a year or so before Derek passed away, it was sort of came to practitioner's attention because of his mobility issues. Actually, you know, Derek could benefit from palliative care and coming in for a, you know, like a short stay. And I remember at the time being so alarmed by the fact, thinking all I knew about palliative care was that it was end of life yeah. and not understanding that there were other, you know, bits and pieces to it and that it meant more about sort of that end piece. 
So it was a bit scary when it first got mentioned to us at the end of 2018. But look, it was it was a good process to go through. We learned more about palliative care and and Derek did a I think it was about two weeks um, at Royal Rehab where he went into the palliative care sort of unit and yeah. um, did all sorts of things, physio, occupational therapy, you know, even speech therapy. Um, and they were really good for him. You know, his spirits lifted throughout that period. He even did hydro, um, some work in the pool, which he absolutely loved because it was the only time he really felt like himself because yeah. of the movement limitations he was having on ground. Um, so that was really great that he could go in and spend that time and, and do that there. So, you know, that was our first sort of experience or interaction with it. Um, and it sort of educated us on it meant more than just end of life. And then when we got to that end of life stage, it kind of unraveled so quickly. And, you know, we weren't, I didn't really even understand what home palliative care would look like and, and you know, the steps moving there to then get to a palliative care facility. And now you've got this great vision uh, for Derek's place. Was that an idea that was burning away when when you and Derek were, were together and you were at, at Concord or did, or did the idea for Derek's place come afterwards? Uh, it, it literally came as my sister-in-law and I sort of, we went and had a look at, at Hammond Care again at, at Greenwich and went to Concord to sort of compare the two. And we literally walked out and, and said we wanted to make a difference and we talked about Derek's legacy. And it was at that point before Derek had died that we looked at each other and said, let's build our own place. Like let, we want to make something better for families. Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, we bit off more than we could chew, and but that's the long term aspiration is to is to be able to you know have our own small palliative care facility that really caters to young families who have children thirteen years and younger. Um, and look, right now it's sort of we've segued a little bit. We provide grants for families that meet our criteria, and we're also providing care packs um, in some facilities where. When families come in, they give, receive a care pack. So the children, based on their age, or the carer receives a pack. And that was really about making that end-of-life experience better inside some of these facilities right now, which, you know, if you go to any type of hospital, a, a child might get, you know, a colouring in book or a couple of sheets yeah. of paper and pencils and that that's the end of it. Um, yep. And I know that, you know, I think that's what Christian got, but I had a really beautiful friend that came in and brought a whole care pack of toys and sorts of things that Christian could entertain himself with when he spent time at the hospital. But there's nothing like that that's happening at the moment when kids go into facilities. Um, and, you know, for right reason, they're not designed for young children because really, you know, people Derek's age shouldn't be dying um, but unfortunately the reality is that it does happen um, mm -hmm. it's not as often as obviously older patients but palliative care facilities a bit like aged care centers they're for older people um, and so when you're bringing young children there's a different element and layer to you know providing for them and that was just something that was missing and was obvious to Rachel and I my sister-in-law and it just sort of we walked away going we want to make a difference and turned our grief into something positive. Yeah, yeah. As you say, you're distributing care packs at the at the moment to support families in in those more traditional palliative care environments. But where's your vision at in terms of building Derek's place, this this family friendly facility that you talk about? Yeah, look, it's it's definitely still our our vision is to do this. Um, you know, it depends on funding, which we quickly learnt was a tall order um, in acquiring money to be able to buy land and then be able to build something but it's definitely still our long-term vision um you know we'd like to see something you know just like a small house that we convert into a small palliative care facility you know mm -hmm. it's still a holistic approach to end of life care but rooms that cater for children being able to stay with their parents alongside them and really making those rooms family friendly so kids activities and sort of built in um, things into the rooms in terms of furniture that you know you can move them away fold them down um, and interactive spaces for everyone to be together as close as they can in those final stages tell me it's perhaps a bit of a big picture question meaning of life sort of question but but what did what did death teach you about life how has this experience changed the way you and Christian and your extended family live? Yeah, look, I think I was always quite 
positive before Derek got sick, um, you know, about life in general, but definitely after Derek's illness and death, um, and I say it all the time is, you know, live in the moment, live for today because you really don't know what tomorrow brings um, and creating as many memories as you can because, yeah, that moment when you get told that that's the end, um, it can change people obviously and, and it does. And for us it was about enjoying each other as much as we can and ensuring that, you know, we're not leaving it for another moment or putting it off too long into the future because you just don't know how long that is. Um, so, yeah, it, de it definitely has changed my perspective on living for the moment. Um, and I think Christian is, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, pass that on to him as well. Yeah. And tell me, you, your family and your your friendship circles, are you any better at, at preparing for the end of life? Have you had those discussions or those sorts of plans in place now? <laughs> Yeah, look, I definitely, you know, I got all my affairs in order <laughs> after Derek passed away um, yeah. with right reason because it's just me and Christian. So ensuring that there was no issues, um, you know, financially too, like I've tried to do that as well as best as I can as a single parent. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I think it's definitely a conversation I've tried to have more openly with my parents as well um, and be more realistic about that end of life space and what that will look like and, you know, having more open discussions about how they want to be buried or cremated and, and understanding wishes rather than leaving it unsaid and then getting to a point where, you know, mental capacity might be at question too, which definitely was the case for Derek because, you know, we left that sort of end of life discussions really too late and his brain had started to deteriorate and there really yeah. wasn't any understanding at that point. So I think particularly with older parents, sort of having those discussions early mm -hmm. is is really key um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page as best they can be when you're talking about things like death. Um, I hope this comes out the right way, but I guess it's 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 really easy to focus on, on the death and forget the grief and bereavement that comes afterwards for, for you, for, for Christian and for Derek's family. What do you do when you need to pick yourself up? How do you deal with that grief and bereavement almost four years on now from, from Derek's death? It's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I, I continuously live with the grief and mm -hmm. there's more days that are challenging than not. Um, I live such a busy life, though, that sometimes I think that grief gets caught up in being too busy. Um, so when I actually do stop and absorb you know, the moment and, and where I'm at, um, it is really hard. But I I look back and I reflect on the memories. I tend to watch videos sort of to, they have like a, it's a catch-22, you know, they have a positive effect on me, but it does make me sad yeah. at the same time. But yeah. I feel more alive when I when I can watch Derek, you know, in real time on, on a video. Yeah. Um, and Christian and I have, have come to enjoying to do that together more often recently as he mm -hmm. sort of progressed through that seven- to eight-year-old mark. He wants to see it more and, and that's really nice. So we kind of bond together when we watch those those home videos or um, there was a really nice package put together by the team at, um, at Hammond Care Dreams Project, which um, is a really beautiful video with some music to it. So we always like to watch that and, and it does make us feel better, even though it's, it's really sad at the same time. Um, but, yeah, look, for both of us, you know, when we ever feel sad and we do something um, that will remind us of Derek, we just, you know, being together and comforting each other and sort of always expressing that it's okay to be sad. You know, that's one of the main things that I, I try and explain to Christian, you know, I think sometimes he might see me crying and he'll say, it's okay, mum, you know, or someone else will see me cry and, you know, it's, we're supportive of each other and even with Derek's family, you know, his mum struggled for a long time afterwards too because she quite couldn't come to terms with the death beforehand, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of us had done um, and that's not always the case, you know. It's not expected that people absorb the, the loss before it's happened but you have to sort of manage your own expectations and, and people prepare themselves differently for that end point. So, you know, there was several months after Derek passed away that 
um, his mum would always be upset and crying, you know, without even just talking about him, which is, you know, completely natural and, yeah. um, we just, you know, that's improved over time. But sort of being comforting with each other and supporting one another has made a huge difference and, and we're all very extremely close. So that's made a big difference in, in sort of remembering Derek and, and but moving on with life as best we can. Yeah, I think what I take from what you've just said is that um, grief is a unique experience, experience to the individual. We all feel it and experience it differently. But also that, um, you know, often I think people think there's an end point to the grief or that, mm. that you recover in, in a way. Yeah. But listening to you, that you live with your grief. It's it's an accepted part of your life. You And when you feel it, you, you deal with it, you acknowledge it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's, there's a few sayings out there about, you know, time heals all wounds and, you know, once you keep moving, it just sits in the background. But for me personally, and I know a lot of other people, when we talk about grief, it's it's not the way. You just, you know, it's always there. You build with it. Um, you learn how to manage it better, hopefully. Um, and that's, you know, a work in progress as time mm -hmm. goes on. But, yes, I think absolutely just accepting that it's always there with you and that it's okay that you're still grieving, you know, X amount of years into the future after your loved one's gone. Natasha, how can people get behind the Derek's Place vision? How can people support you and what you're doing? Oh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, look, uh, yeah, we, you know, we're a very small charity and, you know, do fundraising events, which are a lot of hard work. Um, but, you know, we're looking more and more into grants and sort of being able to apply for larger grants. Um, we just recently received a very generous donation um, from a foundation. So, you know, it's getting our, the word out. Um, people becoming aware of Derek's Place and what we're trying to do. Um, it's a very small, you know, marketplace, if you will, of, you know, the people that we're targeting in the palliative care space, um, those kind of young families where they're losing a young adult. Um, it's not as many people as sort of your old people or, you know, people in their 50s or 60s who have older children. So it is a very small group of people that we are targeting, but it is happening, you know, every year in Australia. There is about two and a half thousand young adults who will die who have young children. So we'd really like to extend the work that we do. We currently only operate in New South Wales, but that's something that with more money and over time we'll be able to extend our reach across other states um, and be able to support young families all over Australia. But, uh, yes, look, raising awareness for our charity is the is the number one thing. And, um, you know, if anyone has a block of land they'd like to donate to Derek's Place or <laughs> knows of anyone that could, you know, resource us in that way, that will definitely help us um, achieve our, our long-term vision much sooner. But, yeah, for now, um, you know, donations are always really greatly accepted and, and welcomed because um, we are completely run off um, donations. So the care packs that we do and the grants that we give out is all purely from our fundraising efforts. And, you know, we're feeling really good about having finally been able to do something in the short term. So helping out those young families is, is, yeah, is key for now. I'll include a link to the Derek's Place website in the show notes to make that easy for, for people to do. And I would love to think there's someone out there with a spare block of land watching this, Natasha. That would be... <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing, Ian. I mean, that's like on the top of my bucket list of things. <laughs> Fingers is crossed. A block, is a free block of land. <laughs> Hey, Natasha, before you go, you work with the Australian Paralympic team. How are we looking for the Paris Games next year? What's the mood oh, in the camp? It's really exciting. I can't believe there's almost, you know, we're just over one year to go to Paris. Um, feels like yesterday we had Tokyo, but because of the postponement from COVID, it means that the cycle was a bit shorter. Yeah. So Paris is upon us, um, but we're definitely excited and lot of lot of great potentials there for um gold medals so look it's going to be a fantastic games and it's been a while since the you know family and friends have been able to travel over for a games um so we're expecting it to be a big event natasha thanks so much for your time today sharing your story Derek's story and christian's story we we wish you well thank you thanks very much ian it was lovely to chat Natasha Welsh, Christian's mum, Derek's wife and the CEO of Derek's Place. Head to the Derek's Place website if you'd like to support their vision to build a family-friendly facility to care for people and families receiving palliative care. Thanks for tuning in to Thursdays at 3, whether that's via PCA socials or on Spotify and engaging in matters of life and death. 
You'll find tools, advice and support at the Palliative Care Australia website. See you next time. Ta-da.